this is pretty much it. You know, the, uh, the real drag about it is teaching was fun when it was one of the things I did. Now it's the only thing I do. And it's also not as good doing it online as it was live. So the reality is my new normal is like everybody else's, I suspect. It sucks. Yeah. But my daughter is an epidemiologist, and she says as long as we can stay healthy, ultimately, this is not permanent. But could it go on for a couple of years? Absolutely. So it, it isn't forever. But it's going to be a while. Well, the interesting thing about it is you're asking about a trend that's going to be defined by a very short period of time. So those are almost oxymorons. Tell me a short-term trend. People are going to be working from home. Whether or not it persists, I have no idea. Because what I also know is <clears throat> collaboration in this medium isn't very good compared to collaboration live. So, you know, short-term, I think working from home is here to stay. I think going to retail is not very positive. I think being in the restaurant business is horrendous. But five years from now, is it likely to be like this? That I would say is highly unlikely. So to me, trends have a longer time horizon than now. Now, the trend is, we know, we're in the middle of it. Work from home, buy online, don't go out, wear a mask. I think those are blips longer blips than we might like perhaps, but five years from now or whatever that longer term, uh, longer term horizon is, are we gonna be eating in restaurants? Yeah, I think so. Are we be traveling on public transportation? Yeah, I think so, you know? So right now I think selling the farm to bet that this is forever is just wrong. So what trends do I see? I think the same trends we saw before, which is People are going to have multiple jobs. They're going to have multiple careers. Um, I think your generation appears to be very comfortable with the notion of nothing lasts forever. And for you, forever is three months. I mean, that's my take on it. But my crystal ball, just so you know, isn't very good. It never has been at anything other than beer uh -huh. and advertising. Those are the two things I sort of made my mark in. So I was good at crystal ball and those things, but... The world at large, I'm not so sure. So this is one that I believe, regardless of whatever's going on in the universe pandemic wise, you need to be extremely strong analytically and extremely creative. And half of it won't get you where you need to go. Being extremely creative without being able to root your creativity in the analytics that the situation provides, gets you to convince GM that they should go into the hot chocolate business. Probably not a good idea. And if all you have are analytics, you just keep telling them to do what they're doing and tweak it 2% every year. Also no good. So that to me is the key. And um, that's not present in that many people, but I believe you can cultivate it. Like some of the courses I teach really focus on creative thinking it's pretty much ignored. It's so funny because I get student comments and say that whole creativity piece is useless. I can tell you when they get to the point where it's not just about pushing buttons, what's going to separate them from the others is how well they come up with solutions that nobody else can come up with. Because one of the big differences between being in sort of my age group and your age group, in your age group, everybody has all the same information and it's close to perfect. In my age group, just having the information gave you an edge. And I think one of the things we're not, or we could be doing better as a school is convincing you that while knowledge is power, all it does is get the lights turned on. It doesn't make anything else happen. It's really not about marketing, it's about leadership. And um, because the thing I think about marketing, and again, just me, Knowing 99% of the situation may be closer to knowing none of it than all of it. But the thing that I know about being a marketer is you're going to need to lead even when you're a junior because you got lots of responsibility and no authority. And then when you get more senior, you'll have the authority. 
but you're going to be working with people that aren't necessarily as capable as you'd like, and you can't fire an entire company. So this is sort of my credo, and that is your job as the leader is to find the beauty in the person because everybody's got something, but just because it doesn't fit with your preconceived notion of what it needs to be doesn't mean you should dismiss them. You've got to figure out how they can contribute. So my experience, oddly enough, I taught all summer, but only had a handful of lectures. They were mostly group meetings. And I found the online lecture is not that different for the students, but it's very different for the teachers. In other words, to be fair, and I've asked my students this over the years, when I'm doing a lecture, I'll just stop and go, let me ask you something. How many people are focused on nothing but my lecture right now? Raise your hand. Answer's consistently zero. And think about your own experience. How many things, have got, how many windows do you have open in the average lecture? More or less than five. So that experience of having a whole bunch of disengaged students, it's very similar. My drag is I like the performance and there's a very low level of performance available in this situation. But what I'm gonna try this time is uh, I'm gonna try recording my lectures, making them available so that people can go back to them. But my experience at this is the students that really dig it are engaged, the students that aren't, aren't, whether you're online or in person. Well, I guess the, uh, my last adventure was being one of the shareholders and doing the marketing at Mill Street. And we had a product that was really well suited. Mill Street was a craft brewery, one of the first ones. We sold it to Anheuser-Busch in 2015. But uh, I had a lot of beer experience when I got there and I recognized that the packaging was wrong. And now most people don't think of marketing as anything as, I'll call it mundane, as getting the pack size right. But we changed the pack size and basically turned the company around and sold it for lots of dough on the strength of this initiative. So we upsized the bottles and uh, bottle size is really important. Packaging is really important in the beverage category. So we made the packaging right and the business took off. And, uh, and, and what it really came from was some instinct combined with some research. Because what was interesting is the bottle size was differentiated from the entire market, which as you learn in marketing is a really good thing unless it's differentiated, but delivers a negative. Sell wine in a wine skin, but who would buy it? It would be different, but really, ew. Um, well, I've been nominated for awards a few times, and that's nice, but one of my favorite ones was I had a student who truly was a brilliant guy. And I mean, by the third or fourth class, I realized, oh, this guy is so much smarter than me, it's unbelievable. So I read the first paper he submits, and it's maybe the best thing I've ever read, not in school, period. And I go up to him after I hand him back his paper and, you know, to walk out, and I say, so what are your plans? He goes, well, I thought I'd join, I, uh, enter into the joint MBA JD program. And I well, you should go to Harvard if you want to go to law school. He goes, they don't take people like me. Uh, they'll take you. Write the SATs. So, of course, he gets like, or the LSATs. Of course, he gets like 800 on the LSATs. Mm -hmm. I write him a recommendation. Another prof writes him a recommendation. He graduated this spring from Harvard Law School. So that's one of those little things that just makes me go, I knew. And he's going to be amazing. Yeah. And here's an interesting thing, because a lot of my marketing was con consumer communication. I think one of the things that happened is the marketplace got digitized was that people lost the difference between the idea and the execution. In other words, when we started out in marketing, people came to us with sketch pads to describe the idea they had in their head, and the execution wasn't discussed for weeks. Now they present executions that look like they're final and ready to go, and people love them because they don't have to visualize what the person is talking about, but sometimes the idea gets lost, so all you do is fall in love with a pretty picture. And most of the time, I would argue that pretty pictures don't sell product as much as consumer insights do. And the value of that, I think, is getting lost. Some of them know, some of them don't, but so I'm a Schulich alum, and I put myself through grad school writing and performing stand-up comedy across the continent. 
What's interesting is even if they've seen me, they still may not know because I wasn't very funny. When I quit the business, I was at the point in my career where the only person that knew I quit was me. So this is only one man's opinion because it's really rooted in my experience. And that is you need to differentiate yourself from the students in the pile because that's what happens now, right? Like, you know, somebody announces a job and a gazillion resumes come in. What are you going to do to distinguish yourself? And because I don't know what that is right now, what I would say is go find out what's most valued and be it. Like in my world, when I was looking for a job in marketing, my homework was to figure out what they were looking for. And, you know, they want good grades, they want extracurriculars, but what they wanted at that time was entrepreneurship. Not because you were going to be an entrepreneur, but they thought, we got a system that works at all these, you know, serious marketing companies. Let's find some people that can both manage the system and work outside it. So when I position myself as a stand-up comedian to my, you know, prospective marketing companies that I wanted to work for, I didn't tell them how funny it was. What I said was I acted as my own booker, agent, and businessman. So I was an entrepreneur running a comedy business where the product was me. It wasn't I was a comedian. And that was a big difference. And what I'm saying is I have no idea what's valued in the community today, but I would find out what it is and go figure out how to do that. Basic salesmanship. What you've got to sell is great if it fits with what they're buying, but a way better tactic is to figure out what they're buying and then go figure out how to deliver it. So what got me interested in marketing was when I was a kid, I was 13, maybe four, no, I was 13. And a couple of friend of mine's dads were art directors. I grew up in New York City. And I went to a shoot for a product. And absolute truth, at this shoot was one of the most famous photographers in the world, two beautiful naked women, and a table full of great food. And I went, yeah, I'm going to do this. From that day on, I decided I was going to own my own ad agency. And I just took progressive steps to do that. And that was the first business that I was involved with, which we sold as well. And what made me teach it? My mom was a teacher and I always respected and valued teaching. And as soon as I had the time to do it, because I was doing a lot of other things, as soon as I had the time to do it, which was after we sold the ad agency, I started teaching. It's something I always wanted to do. You know how hard they work and how much they care. And it's important, you know? The impact you can have on students is mind boggling. I mean, there's a million of them, but what, uh, you know, if you ask me about subjects, mm -hmm. that would be different from professors. Like I'd like to sit in Graham Dean's class because he's consistently one of the most awarded professors, but I don't have a lot of interest in a subject matter. There's some subject matter I'm way more interested in. I'd like to sit in classes now about what I used to call organizational behavior. And now you call it something else because I'm sure what they taught me and what the thinking is now is totally different. You know, after having supervised literally thousands of people based less on that and more on what the world's doing. Well, it's funny, I'm not an Apple guy, but I think clearly that's the greatest achievement in branding in the history of the world. Sorry, folks, that iPhone and this Samsung phone Tell me what the difference is other than the brand, but they get more money for it. I have a Microsoft Surface, great product. The equivalent in Apple is 50% more. Why? So to me, there's nothing that's achieved that level of branding like Apple. It's spectacular. And I mean, and it keeps going. Those earbuds, Apple earbuds are over 300 bucks, yes? That's a functional product, right? It either works or it doesn't. I bought a set of earbuds. $20. I've had them for three years. They work perfectly. So to me, that branding is, it's, it's bizarre. Here's another example that I use in my classes. And I think the branding in alcoholic beverages is also spectacular, though I spent my career in there. So I may be a bit biased, but I'll give you an example. So let's say you're walking down the street. There's a patio and there's identical twin brothers sitting there, each having a beer. 
They're identical twins. You couldn't tell them apart. Their mother has trouble telling them apart. But one's drinking a Budweiser and the other's drinking a Stella Artois. Just by their beer choice, despite the fact they're identical twins, wouldn't you conclude they're completely different people based on their beer choice? Isn't that purely branding? That's amazing. We call those brands windows and mirrors. They're windows because they say something about the person using them and they give observers insight into what kind of people they are. And they're mirrors because you feel a certain way about using it. Like, again, I say this to my classes all the time. I know all the cool kids have apples, right? How many people think they are distinctly cooler because they use Apple products? Hands go up. Yeah, I could. And what's interesting is I do it from the aspect of my course, because what I ask of you is perhaps unrealistic, but I would say, if you want to get an A, put out a level work, but that doesn't mean it's smart to waste your time on that. If you're taking my entertainment marketing course and are an accounting major and you want to get a, a CPA, don't waste your time on entertainment marketing. Have fun with it. You got way more important stuff to do. So if I were to describe it in a nutshell, figure out what your priorities are and live your life to it. And I think that's a really, uh, you know, that's a thought that transcends school. Yeah, work hard in entertainment marketing if you want to be in marketing. If you're taking it as your only elective because you think it'll be fun to hear all about Lady Gaga's first tour, cool. But <laughs> I wouldn't waste my time studying it. I'd cursorily examine it. And again, one of the things we know as faculty is we give you more work than you're capable of doing because one of the skills you need to learn is how to prioritize it. So hopefully that was helpful. So I like beers that, um, that are darker, which means the malt is caramelized, so it's a little sweeter. So you may not have heard of this brand, but it's from Mexico called Negro Modelo. That's my favorite beer. But again, okay. it's a little sweeter, it's dark. But I like beer. I, um, I really made my living in beer for like, well, I started doing comedy when I was 20. And I worked in beer, basically. I worked in the record business. So like, I've been around bars and beer and all that sort of stuff, literally since I've been 20 years old, making a living since I've been 20. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. It's just, you know, it's the way it is. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day.